graduated from OU in December with his degree. Thank you. His degree is in music composition, and he's heading back to OU on Tuesday to begin his studies for his master's degree. I taught him everything that I knew about piano. It took about 26 seconds. Main thing was they're heavy. I know they're very heavy. That was what I taught him. He went on from there, and uh, his mother taught him many of the basics, and, and he just did this brand new. Today, and then the next two Sundays, Lord willing, we're going to do a study on the subject of stewardship. This is a time of year when many pastors across our country focus on stewardship because it's the beginning of the year, and stewardship is about how we manage our lives our time, our health, our finances, our money, and our relationships, and so forth. And at the beginning of the year, it's a time when we kind of take a step back, and most of us look at our lives and we reassess. We reassess how we're spending our time, what we're focusing on, how we're spending our money, how we're taking care of ourselves physically, and those types of things. And so we're going to do a little bit of that over these three weeks, talking on the subject of stewardship. And today... We're going to start at a, a level that I think is very important, and that is how to develop an attitude of contentment. Because it's very important for us to be content. The Bible in the New Testament in particular talks about us being content with the things that we have. And so we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. We're going to read from the King James Version. I like the King James Version, and I especially love how descriptive Paul is in his explanation of the dangers of a life of greed. This is what he says in 1 Timothy 6. He says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, that's clothing, let us be there with content. And now notice these verses. These are really strong words. He says, But they that will be rich. And most translations of the Bible say those who, have a, those who have a desire or a drive to be rich fall into temptation <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> and a snare. A snare is a trap and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, it's a better translation, of all kinds of evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We'll come back to those verses a little bit later. But I want to start with a story that a lady named Lisa Rogak told. She wrote a book a few years ago called Death Born Dover. And from the title, you probably wouldn't guess what the book's about. It actually contains over 70 recipes for funeral dinners, death warmed over, get it? And she also talks about a number of rituals connected with funerals. But she tells this story. <laughs> I've never read the book, no surprise, right? Like, I'm going to read a book about recipes. But she has this one story about this older gentleman who's at home, upstairs in his bed, and he is near the point of death. And he smells the aroma of chocolate chip cookies, his favorite, coming from the kitchen downstairs. And he thinks to himself, I just got to have one more chocolate chip cookie before I die. So in his weakened state, he manages to drag himself out of his bed he can't walk well, so he slowly tumbles down the stairs, and he crawls into the kitchen, and with a trembling hand, he reaches up under the counter, and he grabs a chocolate chip cookie, when all of a sudden, he feels the sting of a whack on the back of his hand, a spatula. Put those back, his wife says. Those are for the funeral. <laughs> hey, I don't write the stories. I just tell them. But that story illustrates to some degree the human condition. It's like we all want just one more 
chocolate chip cookie. One more of something, a little bit more. We're just never satisfied. We always want a little bit more. Solomon in the Old Testament had cookies upon cookies upon cookies. He had it all. But he just seemed to want more and it seemed to never satisfy. And in our life journey, sometimes we just want to grab a hold of a few more cookies. And you can keep doing that, but sooner or later you're going to feel that whack on the back of your hand. And somebody's going to say, no, no, those are for the funeral. Ask not for whom the spatula whacks. It whacks for thee. Now, when we talk about materialism and greed, it can be very easy for somebody to think, well, I don't have a whole lot of stuff. I can barely pay the bills. i am just got the roof over my head pretty much. And so materialism is not an issue for me. I'm not greedy because I just don't have much stuff. Well, let me, let me explain that materialism and greed is not dependent upon how much you have. You can have nothing but bread and water in a humble cottage to live in and be the greediest person in town. Whereas another person could be very well off and not be greedy at all. He could be a very giving, very sharing person. And so it's not a matter of how much or how little you have. It's not a matter of how big your house is or how small your house is or what kind of car you drive. Because contentment materialism, greed, all these things are attitudes of the heart. And again, you could have very little and be very, very materialistic because you could still be driven, unsatisfied until you have more and more and more. You could be like the one person who says, I started out with nothing and I still got most of it. <laughs> I think we can relate to that to a large degree. But I want to introduce three words to you this morning that you've heard before, so maybe I'm not introducing them to you, but words that come from 1 Timothy 6. The words themselves aren't there, but the idea of these three particular words, and I want to build this message around these three words, all right? The first word is the word zero. That's the number of things you take with you when you die. In verse 7, Paul said very directly, very succinctly, he said that we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Now, I know that when I make a statement like this, that zero is the number of things you take with you when you die, that I'm saying something that is very basic, very fundamental to our understanding of life and death. I mean, everybody knows this. Even people who don't go to church know this. Even people who don't profess Christ know this. Hey, even atheists. Most of them would probably agree with this statement that we don't take anything with us when we die. People just know this inherently because they've seen it. We see reminders of it every day. Job said, naked, I came into my mother or came out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return. He recognized there's nothing we take with us when we die. That's why you never see a suitcase positioned next to a casket at a funeral. In all of the funeral services I've been to, I've never seen a man buried with a checkbook in his breast pocket of his suit. I've never seen a woman lowered into the grave with a, a purse with a wad of cash. Because we understand that we don't take anything with us when we die. I mean, it's basic to our understanding. Everybody knows this. So if everybody knows this, you might be thinking, why in the world, Pastor, are you wasting my time telling me about this on a Sunday morning when time is so precious, why are you taking these few minutes to even talk about something that everybody understands? We know this stuff, so why are you bothering me with it this morning? I'll tell you why. Because a significant number of people live their lives as though they can take it with them. We know we can't. If I was to give you a quiz and yes or no, can you take it with you when you die? You'd all say no. You know the answer. But it's so easy to get in the mode of living our lives as though we can. We keep building up more assets. We keep grasping for more. We often gear our lives toward the accumulation of stuff. 
And maybe you may, we not, may not be geared toward becoming a millionaire and being one of the wealthiest persons in America, but that's not really the issue. It's just that greed and that hunger to have more, to never be satisfied with where you are in life. Never being content. I'm going to quote a great American philosopher named Colonel Sanders. I told Sean this the other day. I think he's been giddy all week. I can hardly wait. <laughs> Colonel Sanders said, there's no reason to be the richest man in the cemetery. You can't do any business from there. Wise words, huh? So why do we strive so hard? Oh, there's nothing wrong with earning money, take care of yourself. In fact, we ought to do those things. We ought to be good stewards. But it's when our lives become so geared toward more, to where we're never satisfied, never happy. We just always have this hunger. When we start jeopardizing relationships or our moral decisions or ethical decisions because we want to make more, and those things become more important to us than our principles, then we're being governed by greed. That's when we really need to consider ourselves where we are and do a little inventory with our attitudes because we can get off base. We, we gear our lives toward things that, that aren't even going to last, that are just temporary. And sometimes we seek to find our security in these things that are passing. There's a story I read years ago. I don't know if it's a true story necessarily, but it's about a New York businessman who thought he would save a $20 service charge by changing his own fluorescent light bulb in his offices rather than calling in somebody to do it. So he smuggled in a seven foot long fluorescent light bulb and changed it out himself to put it in to get the old one. But he had the problem of not knowing what to do with the old one. There was no convenient place around his office where you could just stick a seven foot long fluorescent light bulb. But he thought about a place near his home, but of course he had to take the subway to get there. So. Imagine this guy getting on the subway, and he's got a seven-foot-long fluorescent tube. He gets on the subway, and of course he's holding it vertically like this, so as not to hit anybody else. He's holding the fluorescent tube seven feet tall like this and just going on his train, you know. Well, as he continues toward his house, the subway makes numerous stops along the way, and, and as it does, it continues to fill up with more people and gets more and more crowded. And while he's standing there holding that fluorescent tube, other people who get on the subway grab a hold of it, thinking that it's a pole, you know, attached to the subway. So there's like seven or eight people grabbing a hold of this fluorescent tube. So when they finally arrive at his stop, all he had to do was just let go of the tube and, and get on the subway, you know, and he just left it in their hands. Now again, I don't know if that's a true story or not, but how many times do we hold on to things that we think are securely bolted to the floor? How many times do we put our security and our hope in things that have no stability? You know, those people on the subway, that train is to stop, they're going to fly forward, aren't they? You know, you've been on one of those things, you know, they stop and your momentum, that's why they always have to grab a hold of something. And that's not going to provide any security at all. And yet if we invest our lives just in stuff, how many things we can have, how much money we can have in the bank, how many assets we can have, all those things are so unstable. First of all, they can be taken away from us in a heartbeat. But more than that, those aren't going to be the things that provide hope and help in the crises of life. Those aren't the things that are going to be there to bail you out when you're in a jam, when relationships start to fall apart, when you need hope for the future and you have faith and eternity, those aren't the things that are going to be there for you. It's God, it's the Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit, it's people that make the difference, not stuff. So don't put your life, don't, don't put your focus just on things. Because we're going to have to let go of them someday and leave them behind for other people to argue about. So don't let those things dictate your life. You can't take it with you. The second word is the word destruction. This is where the craving for money will lead you. Destruction. Greed is like a monster, like an untamed, an untamed beast. 
You know, it'll, it'll crawl at you, it will grab at you, it will scratch at you. Enough is never in its vocabulary. And if you start heading down that road, it can destroy your life. Remember I mentioned verses 9 and 10? I said I want to come back to those because in these verses are just such a great description of what it can do to you. Paul says that those who have a desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men. Listen to these words. That drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil which while some have coveted after... They have erred from the faith. Notice that. They've erred from the faith. That means they've given away. They've given up on Christianity. They've turned away from God even. They've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I want to lift up two words out of that passage real quick for us to consider. One of those words is the word pierce. He says they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows because what I find interesting about this word is that the word that's used in the original Greek language, it's the only time that it's used in the New Testament. And it refers to like, you know, a spit, one of those long steel pieces that you like cook roast hot dogs on. You know what I'm talking about? You ever been to a weenie roast and you put the hot dog on that sharp end? That's what Paul's referring to. I don't think I have hot dogs in mind necessarily, but he's talking about that type of a thing. And could you imagine being impaled? By one of those things, fortunately, none of our hot dog roasts have gotten that far out of hand where we've been goofing off and, you know, having sword fights or anything. But, you know, that, can we imagine getting pierced through? I don't just mean a small gash. I mean being pierced <coughs> through with one of those. That's what Paul's talking about. That's the image he's given to us for people who are driven by wanting more. He says they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. And then the word perdition. Now there's a word that we never use. The word perdition in verses 9 and 10. Because in this word, he's talking about utter and total ruin. I've been told that during World War II, there were some cities that were just completely Annihilated. I mean, just nothing less, just flattened. And that's the picture I get with the word perdition. He says they, they drown men in destruction and perdition. The love of money does. And that's what can happen to our lives. You know, we start out just wanting a little bit more, but then it grabs a hold of us and we get greedy and we start compromising our standards. We start bending our ethics. And Paul says what happens is you begin to drown in destruction and perdition. And that word perdition means total and utter destruction. And I don't think anybody wants that to happen. But we don't see it, you know, when we start out. We think, oh, I can, I can handle this. I just want a little bit more. Just a little bit more. But then we always want a little bit more, you know. Always want a little bit more. We're never satisfied. So that's why we need to, to keep it under control. I really like this one story that Leo Tolstoy wrote. Leo Tolstoy wrote a number of short stories in the late 19th century. And he wrote one in particular about this successful peasant farmer who just never seemed satisfied with his lot in life. He just always wanted a little bit more. And he got an offer one day. He got an offer from a family that was selling some land and they made him a deal. They said for 1,000 rubles, which was not a great sum of money, very affordable, for 1,000 rubles, he could have all of the land. And remember back in those days, land was more than just property. I mean, this was wealth. Land represented wealth. And then he said he could have all the land that you can walk around in one day. That will give him a spade to mark the territory where you walk. And you can have all the land that you can walk around in one day. It would be yours for a thousand rubles. What a deal. The man was excited. There was just one catch. He had to finish up in his journey where he started before the sun went down. 
So if he started encircling the land, he had to get back to the starting point before the sun went down or else the deal was off. He wouldn't get the land and he would lose his money. So he was excited. The next day he gets there at daybreak. And he's confident because he thinks he can cover a lot of land. And so he begins at a quick pace. And he's walking about as fast as he can. And he's excited about the prospect of all the land that he's going to get to add to his wealth. By the time noontime rolled around, he was getting tired, but he had made good progress and he was happy with how things were going. In the early afternoon, as the sun began to get straight overhead, he realized that his greed had taken him far, far away from his starting point. And he was going to have to really hoof it to get back there before the sun went down. And by this time, the sun was beating down upon him and the heat was causing him to sweat profusely. But he continued on his way, even running at times, where he knew he had to get back to the starting point before the sun went down. As the afternoon progressed and the sun began to set, he began to pick up his pace even more. His heart began to pound. He was gasping for breath. And as the sun was about halfway down the horizon, he could see the starting point. If I could just get back to the starting point, he said, I can have all this land. And so he's running as fast as he can, his heart just beating out of his chest. But as the sun went down, he indeed made it back where the family who had made the offer was waiting. But suddenly, the man collapsed. Blood trickling from his mouth. And in a moment, he was dead. Shortly thereafter, his servants came and took his body and they dug a grave about six feet long, about three feet wide. The title of this short story is How Much Land Does a Man Need? And Tolstoy seems to imply about all the land we need is about a hole six feet long and three feet wide. That's about all any of us is entitled to. And the story is also a lesson in the destructive power of greed. Of this desire to have more and more. Because once it gets a hold of you, Principles and ethics and standards can go out the window. And people have been known to toss relationships aside, even to toss their Christianity aside, their honesty, their integrity. <coughs> Any respect they may have at one time had is gone. And they lose all sense of direction and all sense of respect they may have once had. Materialism, greed, they're destructive powers. And these words of Paul are telling. They drown people in destruction and perdition. They pierce us through with many sorrows. So I want to introduce you to this third word. This is the better word. This is what we all should strive for. The third word is contentment. This is what every child of God should have. Regardless of how much or how little. He or she possesses. Verses six through eight, or six, in verse six and verse eight, in verse eight, Paul says, having food and clothing, let us be there with content. There's contentment spoken of a number of times in the New Testament. Paul in Philippians 4.11 says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. In Hebrews 13.5, he said, let your manner of life be without covetousness, but be content with such things as you have. For God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Contentment. Are you content with what you have? Or are you just 
unsettled until you get more? Is there, is there just a constant nagging in your spirit until you get more and more? And then you're never satisfied. You want more. Or can you just stop and say, God, I'll thank you for what you've given to me. That doesn't mean you don't pursue more. It doesn't mean that you turn down a raise. It doesn't mean that, uh, that you don't try to better your situation. But it means that you're content, satisfied. And with what God does bless you with, you seek to use in a proper way, that you're a giving person. See, greedy people are often not giving people. But you can still be a contented person and even have a lot of money and be a giving person. That's what God's created us to be. Now, I know sometimes people will say, well, well Pastor, I'd like to be content, but I just don't have the contentment gift. <laughs> I want to do a little Bible teaching here for you, okay? The Bible does talk about spiritual gifts. And everybody has different spiritual gifts. Some people have the gift of music, and some people have the gift of singing, and some people have the gift of administration, and some people have the gift of preaching and teaching and missionary work and that sort of thing. And nobody, I and mean, people have different gifts, all right? I, nobody has all the gifts. You know, for, and, um, you know, like, for example, I don't have the gift of singing. I, I've tried to convince people I do, but they all disagree with me, you know. But uh, I don't have it. But see, I don't get down on myself for that because I can't help it. I could take all the voice lessons in the world and I still wouldn't have the gift of singing. It's just not something I was gifted with. Just like some people have a certain gift and other people have different gifts. These are spiritual gifts and they're different for every person. Contentment is not a spiritual gift. It is a Christian trait. It is a characteristic that we are to develop and there's a big difference. So we can't just say, well, I just don't have the gift of contentment. That's like saying, well, I don't have the gift of love, so I can't love people. Or I don't have the gift of giving grace to people. No, 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 no. These are traits that we are to develop and work on, not gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit for the work of the church. These are individual traits that we all are to develop. Remember, in Philippians 4.11, Paul said, I have learned, key word, I have learned in whatsoever state or condition I am in to be content. He had to learn it. He didn't say, I was gifted with it. It was a trait that he developed and he learned. See, I have a problem with a lot of us at times, and we've probably all been prone to this once or, once or twice, and some people all the time, is playing the if-only game. You ever do that? We say, well, if only I had a better job, I'd be content. Or if only I had more money, if only I had a better car, if only I had more friends, if only I had better health, if only I lived in a different neighborhood or maybe in a different state, if only I were taller, shorter, better looking, thinner, heavier, whatever, I'd be more content, more happy with my life, but, you know, as things are, no. But if only I get those things, or at least one of them, and then you get that, and then your mind gets into that mode of thinking again, well, if only I had this now. And if only I had that. And this is the if only game. And so we're never happy. We're never content because we're always, if only I had this. Do you think the Apostle Paul was sitting in that Roman prison writing the letter to the Philippians and saying, well, you know, I'd be content if only I weren't in jail. He didn't say that. He said, I've learned in whatever condition I am in to be content. He didn't say, if only I, or if only people treated me better, they didn't beat me all the time. Paul was content. And I venture to say you have more than what Paul had. You got freedom for one thing, which you didn't always have. You don't get beaten every day, hopefully, by the authorities. And Paul had contentment. And I don't think I look at that and I think if he could have contentment, then why can't I? Why can't we all have contentment? I know it's a challenge, and I know that there's a lot in this world that tries to open our eyes and say, hey, you need this and you need that. Advertisements almost make you feel like you have to have something. I just ignore them and say, no, I don't, I'm all right. Thank you very much. But they try to get into your head, you know? Say, you're not somebody if you don't have this. Just ignore them. It's just all lies. You do know Hollywood lies, right? <laughs> Madison Avenue, they lie. You do know that, right? Okay. Be content. You know how I think the greatest way to be content and learn contentment is? Gratitude. Just make your life a pattern of gratitude. Just every day, thank God. I mean, just as you go down the road, whatever, as you're walking in life, just thank God for this and thank God for that. Maybe in right sound some things you're thankful for. And watch the list grow. Because the more you focus on gratitude, you begin to see what all you have. And you say, wow, I have really been blessed. I may not have as much as some other people, 
I may not even have as much as I think I deserve. I may not be wealthy, but I'm blessed. Be content. I want to share this quote from Seneca, who was a Roman philosopher. He said, it is not the man who has too little who is poor, but the one who craves more. Isn't that true? It's not the one who has too little. I've known some very contented poor people in my life. Quite a few of them. Content and happy and praising God. Beautiful to see. And I've seen people who have a lot, but they just keep craving more. They're just never happy. <coughs> I feel sorry for them. It's a shame. So don't look at how much you have, how little you have. Look at your relationship with God. And say, God, help me be content with what I have. Help me be grateful for what you've blessed me with. And to be a good steward of what I have. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father.